Hello everybody and welcome to this new ISD TWF repair video. Today I have on my bench a 20 inches black and white arcade vector monitor that has been sent for repair. It is a Antarex MTRV made in Italy. Luckily a service manual that includes full schematics is available for download. As always a link to it is in this video description. Actually, I received a complete monitor with a quite worn out CRT, as you can see from the phosphor bars, plus another electronic board also not working, so the chances of fixing at least one of them should increase, right? This monitor comes from an hyperspace cabinet. It was an Atari Asteroids bootleg made in Italy by the company Rumiano in 1979. This sticker also reports the monitor's fault in Italian. It says that it blows the fuse in the high voltage CRT power supply board. Before starting the actual troubleshooting, it is always a good idea to have a look at the relevant part of the schematics. The CRT power supply is the MTRV3 PCB. This circuit is powered directly by a center tapped power transformer with approximately 34 volts AC on each phase. The AC input is then rectified and smoothed by an electrolytic capacitor. The rectified DC voltage is then regulated to approximately 30 volt DC by a simple 3 transistor linear regulator referenced with a 9 volt zener diode. This 30 volt rail is the so called B plus voltage and can be set via RB1 trimmer. A simple 555 square wave oscillator is used as exciter for the flyback transformer circuit. This oscillator has two trimmers, RB2 and RB3, to set its frequency and duty cycle. However, these two controls will interact. Notice that the 12 volt supply for the 555 is obtained with a big 5 watts resistor, R12, and a simple Zener stabilizer. The square wave then drives a two stages transformer coupled transistor pair that switches to ground one tap of the primary winding of the flyback transformer, like if it was a normal raster CRT flyback circuit, except that we don't have the horizontal deflection coil in this circuit. Notice that there isn't any form of feedback from the secondary generated voltages back to the primary side, except for this circuit that kills the input fuse if one of the secondary voltages climbs over about 110 volts. As usual, there is one very high voltage secondary winding with internal diodes for the CRT anode supply. And then a low voltage multi tap secondary winding, judging from the schematics at least, that generates a focus and screen grid voltage, a cathode bias, and a small AC voltage for the CRT filament. Having successfully designed a complete CRT power supply for vector service, I can tell that this circuit is not a very good one, for several reasons. For example, there is no feedback from the secondary voltages back to the primary side, so they will vary depending on the actual quantity of vectors drawn on screen. However, it was used with good success on thousands of Italian-made arcade cabinets. Before powering on, it's always a good idea to clean the dust of the PCB, especially when there are voltages higher than 100 volts. I've then checked with the multimeter all the diode and transistor junctions, finding no obvious fault except for the base to emit the junction of the flyback driver transistor that gives a very low reading in both directions. A low reading, however, is normal on these transistors with the internal damper diode, as they also have a low ohmic connection between base and emitter. So, if the base to collector and the internal diode junctions show the correct one way diode drop, then the transistor is likely good. Anyway, a quick check on the curve tracer confirms that the transistor is indeed in perfect shape.
Of course, the blown fuse must be replaced, but the first power on will be without the final flyback transistor installed. First, I want to set the voltage regulator DC output. And it works fine. Next, I want to check the 12V Zena diode output. This one looks good too. The last thing to check is the final transistor dry waveform. But with transformer coupling and without the transistor installed, the waveform shows too much ringing. If we really need, the waveform can be improved by connecting a diode in place of the base to emit transistor junction. But in this case, I just thought uh, it was not needed. I then checked the square wave output of the 555 and set it approximately for equal on and off times, as that's usually a good starting point for further tuning. At this point, having found no obvious issues, I decided to reinstall the flyback driver transistor, but also to add an incandescent lamp in series with its collector, so that will give me some time to look around for faults without the risk to blow the fuse on the transistor itself. However, with a 30V B plus voltage, the choice of a suitable lamp is quite difficult. All I could find in my collection is a 24V 1A lamp. This one will probably glow even on a correctly working circuit. A good choice is usually a lamp with about the same current rating of the B plus fuse and a working voltage as close as possible to the actual B plus voltage but incandescent lamps are getting rare nowadays. I've also decided to remove D4. That's the thinner diode that would cause the DC fuse to blow in case of too high CRT and the supply. It would not trigger with the series lamp installed, but it could give troubles later if I decide to remove the light bulb. The last thing to do before switching the power on is to remove this connector. It brings the cathode bias voltage to the main deflection and driver board, so a fault in this solar PCB could short or load too much this DC output and affect the correct operation of the flyback circuit. Everything is ready for the first test. A C power connected. This one just connects the circuit ground with the CRT ground. The next PCB is still unconnected. The oscilloscope probe is connected to the collector of the driver transistor. The cathode bias voltage will be measured with a multimeter. And last but not least, the high voltage probe will show the CRT anode supply voltage. Now, that was quick, but let's review what happens. The top multimeter shows the cathode bias voltage, and the bottom one is connected to the high voltage probe. This is right at power on. Cathode bias is still at 0V, and the anode supply is at 3.6kV, which is very far from the 12 to 14kV nominal values. A fraction of a second later, the cathode bias voltage jumps to about 50 volts, which is more or less half its current value, and the anode supply starts fading away very quickly. In fact, the anode supply stabilizes to around 300 volts, while the cathode bias remains at a bit less than 50 volts. Then, as I switch the power off, the anode supply jumps again at more than 2 kV before all the voltages quickly fade away. Well, this is very strange indeed. If I power on by passing the light bulb, the voltage outputs show a different behavior. The cathode bias collapses to 1.1V and the anode supply remains at about 3.5kV. In this situation, however, the fuse blows in about 10 seconds. I've taken a screenshot of the driver transistor collector waveform without the light bulb in series. 
First, we observe that the flyback peak is too low, less than 150 volts, while, according to the service manual, it should last longer and have two peaks of about 220 volts each. Also, we observe that during the collector conduction, there is a linear ramp on the collector voltage. This means that the collector current is too high for the given base drive, and this can happen if something is shorting the transformer during the forward period of the cycle. To exclude any possible external short, I have lifted both R8 and R11. This disconnects all secondary windings, since also the filament connection is not present with the neck PCB removed. Unfortunately, this does not change anything. I have also substituted C9, which is the flyback capacitor, in case it was failing only at some high voltage, but nothing changed also in this case, so the problem, I'm afraid, is internal to the flyback transformer. That is obviously something very difficult to replace nowadays. So I've decided to look at the other chassis, hoping to have more luck. During the first visual inspection on the other chassis, I've noticed that the winding assembly of the flyback transformer was detached from the epoxy that secured it to the far right core and was free to slide up and down. So first I applied some glue to attach it again to the original epoxy blob. I then repeated all the semiconductor checks and all the previous steps already done for the other chassis up to the first power on with a serious light bulb. Wow, this was much brighter than the other one. This time the anode supply shows almost no DC voltage. A very high primary current and no DC voltage on the anode secondary can be caused by a few different failures, but one of them is surely easy to check. It could be caused by a shorted high voltage diode. This kind of diodes are usually made with a serious string of silicon junctions and cannot be tested with the usual multimeters since their test voltage is not enough to polarize all the serious junctions. I'm going to use a 14 volts power supply to test this diode string, but a more useful voltage for diodes used in color CRT supplies would be 24 volts. The red clip connects the power supply positive to the transformer ground. The power supply negative is connected to the voltmeter negative probe. And last, the positive meter probe is connected to the anode cap. In this way, we'll test the diode forward drop. Well, this is surely bad. The drop is only a fraction of a volt, and it should be more than 10 volts for sure. Now, to double check, let's see what we get with the reverse polarity. Now, the supply negative goes to ground and positive goes to the meter. The meter's negative goes to the anode cap. We get almost the same drop. This means that this diode turned into a short circuit. Now, the high voltage diode is embedded into the transformer assembly, so it can be just replaced. However, we can try adding a new diode in the middle of the anode wire after cutting it. I don't have a good replacement in the parts box, but I found this old high voltage rectifier into an old 19 inches tube TV chassis. This one should be good to 18 kV. The black stripe goes to the anode cap. So I've split the anode cable and soldered the diode, paying attention for the correct polarity. Of course, I'll expose the high voltage connections must be insulated with some thick plastic enclosures. This is just a temporary connection, just for testing. So let's see... Hmm, a bit less than 4 kV. And the lamp is much dimmer visually. Also, the collector waveform shows the sweet double peak. Of course, the peaks reach barely 100 volts because of the series lamp. 
The bottom trays shows the base dry waveform. Good, the high voltage supply goes to almost 9 kV. However, the fuse still blows after a few seconds. I suspect that's because the so-called protection circuit kicks in. This circuit should be triggered by a cathode bias voltage greater than 110 volts. So let's measure it. Yeah. Indeed, it was the protection triggering. So I removed the default Zener diode to disable this circuit. By the way, it's a really ineffective protection. In fact, the cathode bias voltage is obtained from a forward rectified secondary winding, so its output voltage depends only from the actual B plus voltage and the length of the conduction interval of the driver transistor. The anode supply voltage instead depends also on the duration of the flyback interval and the actual value of the CRT beam current and also from any other load present on the other secondary windings. Now I'll try to set the frequency and duty cycle of the driver waveform to obtain a suitable anode voltage without exceeding about 105 volts on the cathode bias secondary. Unfortunately, the two trimmers interact, so it would be an iterative and long process. Well, seems like it's not possible to reach the 12 kV nominal output without exceeding too much the 105V limit on the cathode bias. Also, I checked the collector driver peak and it's already higher than the nominal 225V indicated on the manual. So, it's now time to test the monitor with a real arcade game. So I connected one of my Atari Asteroids PCBs to it. So everything is ready for the test. Of course I can turn everything on and off with a single switch. Hmm, I can hear the typical to chatter noise, but it doesn't seem to display anything. Oh, wait! These are the UFO shots. Let me play with the brightness control. Yes, indeed, the monitor is working, but the brightness control can barely make the beam visible, probably because the anode voltage is a bit too low. Okay, actually, using also the contrast setting, I've obtained a much better picture, but both settings are now almost their maximum. Of course, I cannot leave the old high voltage diode in this monitor, so I've looked for possible new replacement diodes. These high voltage devices are not easy to find anymore, but I found a new old stock BY476, which is a 16kV diode suitable for this black and white CRT.
Every high voltage junction needs to be carefully insulated, so I've used suitable rubber tubing. Then I added some heat shrink she and another plastic pipe to avoid any bands near the diode. The new diode is also much more efficient and probably has much less inverse leakage current, so we gained almost half a kilovolt with it in place of the older one. I think the result is very acceptable, considering also that this particular CRT has seen a lot of views, judging from its noticeable phosphor burns. Unfortunately, the other chassis cannot be easily repaired without a suitable flyback transformer replacement. I hope this was an interesting repair video anyway.